Very good. So welcome everyone to tonight's talk uh, armchair travel program called Iran Persian Glory and Islamic Re Revolution. I'm very glad to see you all here. Um, but before I tell you more about our speaker, I want to let you know that I'll mute you all upon entry. But you may put your questions in the chat box and um, I will pose them to Barry at the end. We'll, we'll talk about that at the end. And then you'll have the ability to unmute yourself as well. So but if you could wait to ask a question uh, when uh, Mr. Pell's finished speaking, that would be great. And this program is being filmed for Milton Access Cable. And also, I want to thank the Friends of the Milton Public Library for their support of my events. I am going to let one more person in here. OK, so now let me tell you about our presenter, Barry Pell. He's a world traveler and photojournalist, and he has traveled widely over five decades, visiting and documenting landscapes and cultures in nearly 170 countries on all continents. He has also lived and traveled in China, Eastern Europe, North Africa, and South America, and currently lectures on international cultures at schools, universities, and institutions in the Boston area. Now, please join me in a warm welcome for Barry. Thank you, Jean. And uh, I especially want to thank the Friends of the Milton Public Library for sponsoring this program. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, at least I get to see your faces, uh, if not in person. And uh, today we are going to the country of Iran. And of course, Iran has been in the news uh, in the past several months more than usual because of the conflict in the Middle East. And it's not my intention here to delve into the uh, ups and downs of that uh, immediate conflict, but rather to give you a bit of an introduction uh, to the inside of this country, uh, to explain a little bit of its history, uh, the uh, culture, uh, which is so rich uh, over its 3,000-year uh, history in the arts and the uh, applied arts uh, and, uh, and architecture as well. And especially, especially to give you an entree to the people. Uh, and that's who has been, it always is the focus whenever I travel to a country is to get to know the people and, to, and rather than uh, the uh, political pronouncements or the uh, attitudes of the uh, leaders, the government leaders, to understand how people feel about their country, about its policies and about their attitudes toward the United States and about and towards other countries in the world. Uh, and that's what I will focus on. So uh, since the uh, Islamic takeover of this country, which happened now ooh, it's almost uh, seven decades ago, I guess, uh, six decades ago, in 1979, Iran has been portrayed to the West and especially to the United States as a fanatical regime. And also, perhaps even more importantly, its people have been portrayed as very hostile to the United States. And yet, Whenever I've met over the years uh, Iranians who've emigrated to the United States, I, they didn't seem to fit that image at all. And when I had friends who traveled there, and indeed, even with the current conflict, it is still possible for Americans to get a visa to travel to Iran. And it's safe for that travel. And uh, Americans who came back, travelers who came back to the United States before I went there, also didn't have an image of Iranians as particularly unfriendly or, or aggressive or, or, or hostile to Americans. And so faced with this seeming paradox, I felt that the, as I always do, that the best way to really get to know the truth is to go there for myself and to learn as much about the country as I could. And so this program is the result of those travels. And what I discovered is a modern country that in many ways is much different uh, than what has been said uh, or written about by our government and by the media. And so in this hour, I'd like to explain a little bit of what I learned on Iran's proud history and how that history indeed has shaped the country's tradition, its religion and modern day life, and also how it, uh, the attitudes that it has toward the West. And I'll also be discussing and showing you some of Iran's magnificent architecture and applied arts, as well as its, uh, in many places, beautiful landscape. Uh, so let's first just take a look at the a map, if I could. 
to get rid of this. Yeah. Okay, so here is a map uh, showing the relationship of uh, Iran to uh, the in the Middle East. Iraq is it has some seven countries that border it, uh, including such volatile places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and uh, also it's bordered by two large bodies of water, the Caspian Sea on the north and the Persian Gulf and the continuation of the Arabian Sea on the south. Some of the cities that you may have uh, heard of uh, include, of course, Tehran, which is the capital and largest city up in the north, uh, Eshfahan, which is the historic capital, the ancient capital of the Persian Empire uh, here, one of the most visited places in the country. Um, and uh, then even before Eshfahan was a capital, Persepolis was the place that was built to be a, ca to be a uh, capital when the Persian Empire began, and the ruins of Persepolis can be visited today. Uh, other places include Shiraz, named after which, from which we get the uh, famous wine, um, Shiraz wine. And uh, during my travels, I covered some 3,600 miles in the country, uh, and I visited probably a little less than a dozen different countries. Okay, so... Um, Uh, did I say countries? A dozen different cities. Okay. Um, so let's go to the photos. Great. And great. So of all my countries that I've seen, I think more than any place I've been, the Islamic Republic of Iran which is its official name, is a place that for Americans and for many other foreigners conjures an enormous range of thoughts and feelings. And the West's understanding of the country is complicated by many things. First of all, by its deep history with the beginning of the Persian Empire. Here is a uh, picture I'll be speaking more about of the ruins of Persepolis, the capital of that empire, stretching back some 2,500 years. And of course, since that time, the current events, especially since the revolution in 1979, and accordingly, America's relationship with Iran has shifted dramatically as well. At one point, uh, for many decades before the revolution, there was a very close friendship between Iran and the United States during the rule of the Shah. But then, of course, after 1979, and since that time, some um, varying levels of open hostility under the Ayatollahs since the revolution. Well, in particular, the most dramatic event, I think, was the taking of 52 Americans as hostages for 444 days between 1979 and 1981 that uh, created a rift in diplomatic relations with many hostile words and covert conflicts uh, between both of our two countries, which continues now uh, some five decades later. The former U.S. Embassy in Tehran was converted to a museum. This is the outside wall of it. It was referred to uh, today as the U.S. Den of Espionage. And along the front wall is a line of murals suggesting the evil of the great Satan. That would be, of course, the United States uh, as well as Israel, including one image, uh, one mural in which the face of the Statue of Liberty is rendered as a menacing skull. Symbolism, of course, is unmistakable. And there are suspicions that abound on both sides, from the US to Iran and vice versa. And those suspicions, those hostilities, I must say, have been encouraged by radical political leaders and fueled by the media. Well, inevitably, as our countries have grown further apart, broad misconceptions and misunderstandings have grown, not only of Iran's politics, uh, which is an obvious subject, but also of its religion, of its customs, of its very rich culture, and perhaps most importantly, what are the aspirations of the Iranian people? 
There are lingering fears from the hostage crisis, which have been reinforced by U.S. State Department travel warnings, placing Iran at the top of the most dangerous list. And that have kept, has kept Americans away. Now, relations, relations thawed a bit during the Obama administration, and American tourism during that time grew to about 5,000 people annually. But since then, it has declined to under 1,000 people. Now, keep that number in mind. 1,000 tourists come to learn about Iran from the United States. In contrast, tourism to Iran from the rest of the world exceeds 5 million people every year. Clearly, the absence of American tourists has kept to us, this country, as virtually a hidden and complete mystery. Well, as with any complex issues, there is no monolithic truth, but a multitude of considerations that reflect the reality of what life in Iran is like today. And so my objective to go there in person was to observe and to learn about these multiple facets directly without the intermediate distortion of political pronouncements or media biases. And what uh, I learned together, I traveled there with my wife, she's the one on the right, what we discovered was a country and a people that frankly are astonishingly different from what we expected. Indeed, the reality, such as, for example, this well-stocked spice market, which was typical in a country where we were told, we have been told, that sanctions against this country have decimated their shops, there's nothing for sale, people are starving didn't appear that way to us. And so what we learned was in such contrast to mainstream conventional wisdom that we felt the need to try to forget everything we had heard before about Iran and to start with pretty much a clean slate. Now, I hear some of you thinking perhaps that uh, maybe I, my Iran travels were stage managed to sort of show Potemkin villages of false abundance uh, by the authorities to show only a glossy image. Not true. <clears throat> Americans, as well as British and Canadians, are required to be escorted by a guide during their Iran visit. And uh, this is our 32-year-old guide, Abdullah. But our guide, and we were taken privately uh, in a uh, private individual vehicle, we were the only uh, people with him, we defined where we wanted to go, which cities we wanted to go, what people we wanted to stop at, and he was amenable to anything we requested. We certainly benefited from his knowledge of the country, his knowledge of the roads, its customs, where to go for some of the best food, and of course, his translation of the Farsi language for us. But uh, even some signs, as uh, Iran has made efforts to translate a few things into English, uh, defied all of our interpretation. Well, our guide, to say the least, was himself very critical of some government policies, and he shared that uh, objection uh, in during our travels. Whenever we encountered local people who seemed interested to speak with us, he encouraged this contact. We pointed out people in a crowd who we wanted to speak with. When necessary, he, spoke, he served as interpreter, although many people did speak English. And then, being a young guy, at the end of the day, he wasn't interested in staying with us older folk, and he let us be on our own after five o'clock. And so we would go out, uh, select a restaurant, any restaurant that we wanted to, and invariably we would meet people who would start up conversations with us, tell us how they felt about the country, uh, about their lives in Iran, uh, and even invite us to home dinners. Um, I also went out before our guide showed up uh, in the mornings for uh, morning walks. I encountered local Iranians doing morning exercises separately for men and for women. Uh, some people I met on the street certainly expressed support for their government and its policies, but many, many people also publicly, very openly, I was shocked at first, criticized the personal limitations imposed 
by the Islamic system that has taken control of the country since 1979. Now, upon entering the country, uh, we weren't asked any probing questions. I was electronically fingerprinted, which is exactly the same as most foreign visitors to the United States encounter. And at departure, I was routinely stamped out. No one asked any questions. No one uh, wanted to know who I spoke with, where I went, or even cared to examine my very detailed journal. Now, one of the mistaken beliefs about Iran is that it is that the landscape is quite ugly, that it's a relentless, featureless, featureless and mostly uninhabitable desert. In fact, only about one fifth of Iran is desert. Half the country is covered by mountains, often rugged, some dramatically beautiful, especially in the late afternoon sun. Iran is truly a diverse land where desert plateaus are bordered by magnificent snow-capped mountains and cliffside villages cling to the sides of hills uh, and contrast with palm-filled oases. About a third of the country's total surface area is suited for farmland. And uh, 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 over nearly 15% is uh, under cultivation of the country's livestock. Sheep are by far the most numerous. Now, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, the country is bordered by two uh, seas. One is the Caspian Sea on the north and the Persian Gulf and Arabian Sea on the south. Uh, there are the majestic Alborz Mountains, which skirt the Caspian Sea, and their slopes are densely and beautifully forested up to some 7,500 feet elevation. And there's great hiking in those hills. Iran has two small deserts, one in the north, uh, one in the southeast of the country, but these themselves are dotted with luxuriant oases where Crops can grow, and we saw evidence of those uh, through our time traveling through the country. Lots of fresh fruits and vegetables uh, from that are grown from underground water sources that feeds stands of, uh, among others, palm trees and pomegranate date palms and pomegranate trees. And so there is quite a variety of fruit on offer to the public. But probably their most famous crop, which you may be familiar with, is pistachio nuts, shown here growing on a pistachio tree. Iran is the third of the largest producer of these savory nuts. It accounts for 40% of the world's supply of pistachios. And traveling around the country, we encountered nut shops everywhere. And frankly, I never knew there were so many varieties. Although they are banned from commercial import into the United States because of the U.S. sanctions, tourists, including Americans, can purchase as much as they want for home personal consumption. Now, Iran is one of the most seismically active nations in the world. Nearly half the structures in the country, however, are not built to earthquake-resistant standards, particularly outside of the cities and towns, and especially in the most rural villages. And so uh, when earthquakes occur, there is quite a lot of uh, physical damage and loss of life. The country itself is about a fifth the size of the contiguous 48 United States. It has a population of 83 million, about uh, one-fourth the American population. It is the second largest nation in the Middle East after Saudi Arabia. And I also was surprised to learn that it is highly urbanized. About three quarters of its people live in cities. The capital is Tehran, located in the north. It has a population of some 7 million. And it is also the hub of communications and transportation. So during our travels, we visited about a dozen cities, a little less, and this room is typical of our very comfortable mid-price level accommodations. We traveled in the early summer when even temperatures at higher elevations in major cities like Tehran often reach about 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. So finding a shady spot to relax or perhaps to sell your wares under a sun umbrella, would it became a priority. And we were delighted to find that many streets and visitor sites provide free 
ice-cooled water containers of very, very safe and delicious drinking water as you wander its streets. I was also surprised to find that Iran's regional roadway network is quite excellent. There are many sections of divided highway here. And by the way, the Iranians love to showcase their culture. They're very proud of that culture. And so it's very typical, and I've often wondered why the U.S. doesn't do this. It's very typical for Iran to feature on the uh, unused space in the middle of a roundabout or a rotary uh, some traditional aspect of their culture. In this case, it's a traditional ceramic pot as decoration. Now, before I went to the country, my friends, family warned me about the dangers of travel in Iran. They imagined religious fanatics attacking me or gun-toting kidnappers. Well, none of that was even remotely possible. In fact, the greatest hazard we faced was traffic, the fiercely aggressive drivers who pay virtually no notice of road rules and who constantly brought us within inches of collisions and as pedestrians sent us fleeing across streets. Well, who takes the right of way in this situation is obviously an insider's game with their own rules based in part on the size of the vehicle, and perhaps even more so, who has the loudest car horn? And we truly would not have survived without the assistance of our guide who navigated us across busy intersections, taking each of our hands. Tehran is one of five of the country's cities with a metro transit system. Others are in the construction or planning stage. Now, another misconception about Iran, perhaps people are thinking about neighboring Iraq and Afghanistan, who, which has suffered so greatly uh, during decades of warfare. Uh, this misconception is that the country doesn't have much to offer because it's been basically bombed a lot and that the cultural artifacts have been destroyed by war and looting. Indeed, Certainly, Iran does have a geostrategic location surrounded by important countries of the Middle East and over its uh, long history has had uh, wars with adjacent kingdoms in Arabia, Turkey, the Roman Empire, and even Russia. And in more recent times, Iran fought an eight-year war with Iraq in the 1980s, and there were hundreds of thousands of casualties that left emotional scars that, frankly, are still fresh on the minds of many Iranian people. And today you can find these uh, the uh, results of that war, the uh, lives that were lost, memorialized in shrines and in many cemeteries. But the physical damage of that fighting, most of which occurred in Iraq and not in Iran, the physical damage has been all repaired. And so as you travel across the country, there's hardly a shred of evidence of any warfare that occurred over the generations. There are offices and residences, museums and shopping centers that have been rebuilt or newly built in traditional and very modern styles in almost every urban area. And so consequently, Iran's culture is very much intact and it is on display at archaeological sites, at Islamic buildings, museums, and even private residences like this lavish residence. And the Iranian people are, well, they're rightfully proud of their heritage. The government has taken steps to protect historic artifacts and restore their architecture. There are indeed 24 sites in Iran that are contained on the United Nations World Heritage List, which makes it among the top 10 countries in the world for so many recognized sites of great cultural value. Now, Iran's History is complex and detailed, and as I've mentioned, complicated by its location at the crossroads of ethnic groups and tribes and invading armies. And while this is certainly not a history program, I couldn't begin to tell you the history of this country in an hour, but I think it's important to just highlight some key events that influenced and shaped Iranian culture and which I believe helped to understand the present-day attitudes of its people towards its neighboring countries and other Western countries. Iran 
truly had one of the world's oldest and richest civilizations, dating to around 3000 BCE. It reached the pinnacle of its power in the year 550 BCE when Cyrus the Great, this is uh, his tomb here, founded the first Persian empire. Now the word Persia very simply refers to the name of the people who were first, who were living on the land when it was first conquered and who were ruled by the empire. And that was called the Pars tribe from which we get Persian. At its height, the Persian empire comprised major portions of the ancient world. It extended across the Red Sea into Ethiopia and East Africa, it went to the Balkans and Europe, and even on to the Indian subcontinent. It was indeed the largest empire the world had seen up to that point. And to celebrate the greatness of this empire as a symbol for it, where subjects would come from far-flung provinces to pay homage and tribute to the Persian kings, as represented in these stone slabs and depicted in these friezes. The rulers built the ceremonial capital in the south middle of the south center of the country called Persepolis. This majestic capital once spread over 50 square miles. It was built over a period of 150 years and is considered the greatest success of the ancient Persian empire. This is a scale model of the, uh, of the capital at the foot of the site, and truly it is the country's most famous ar archeological attraction. Well, the ruins just behind it on the site are certainly a mere shadow of Persepolis's former glory. But even their existence is in part due to the fact that the ancient city had been lost for centuries. Therefore, it was somewhat protected by the sands of time. And it wasn't until the 1930s that extensive excavations revealed its glories once again. The entire site, as you see here, is built up on a platform accessed by monumental stairways carved from single massive blocks of stone. The palace entryways are flanked by enormous columns and statues, and the palace walls are carved with base reliefs depicting scenes of splendor that must have accompanied the arrival of delegations to meet with the king. Several miles from the site, are the tombs of the early Persian Empire kings shown here, uh, shown here in this image, uh, built high up on a mountainside in order to protect those tombs, uh, uh, hewn into this vertical cliff and accompanied also above them by uh, inscribed inscriptions detailing the lives of these early Persian Empire rulers. Now, another misconception about Iran pertains to its religion. Certainly, we think of Iran today as dominated by the Islamic religion in governance and laws, the Islamic Republic. And it is the Shia branch of Islam that is the official state religion to which some 90 to 95 percent of the Iranian people belong. About 4 to 8 percent are Sunni Muslims, the other sect mainly Kurds. But the thing to keep in mind is that Islam is not a homegrown religion. It was imposed on the Iranian people by Arab invaders when they arrived in the seventh century. Indeed, Iranians can be quite upset when they are referred to as an Arab country, which they are not, rather than what in truth is their illustrious Persian roots. And so the religion, the founding religion of the Persian Empire was not Islam. It was a religion that is much older called Zoroastrianism. Uh, it's, uh, this is believed to be an ancient example of a Zoroastrian temple. Now, officially, Iranians practicing Zoroastrianism today only number in the tens of thousands in Iran. But many of the traditions and ceremonies that are practiced every day in Iran date back to Zoroastrian times, are part of Zoroastrian religion. For example, the Iranian New Year, known as Nowruz, is a Zoroastrian holiday. 
In Zoroastrianism, the elements of fire and water are sacred, representing ritual purity. There's an eternal flame at the holy center of their temples, and they're very simply adorned in contrast to Islamic temples. The most distinctive feature is a winged figure of a guardian spirit whose wing feathers represent, in three directions, represent purity of word, thought, and deed. Now, Zoroastrianism, as well as, and this was surprising as well to me, as well as Christianity and Judaism are officially recognized and protected minority religions in the country. They are represented in the Iranian parliament. And this is the beautiful interior of an Armenian Orthodox Christian church. So even after the rise of Islam in the seventh century and the loss of direct influence of Zoroastrianism, which had been dominant in the region for over a thousand years, it still maintains a very important part of Iran's cultural heritage in its festivals, its customs, its holidays, and also through the works of the country's revered poets and writers. From the 10th to 11th centuries, Iran flourished in a golden age of literature and philosophy and medicine, as well as art. And this cultural revival during those centuries led to a resurgence of Iranian pride and national identity, which enabled its people to resist the influence of its Arab invaders. In particular, there was a blossoming of literature and scientific writings in the Persian language rather than in Arabic, and that contributed significantly to their regained sense of pride and independence. Now, in my travels around the country, I was frequently impressed by the influence of Persian literature in modern life. Iranians still gather on weekend mornings to take turns reciting famous poems. Iranians regard their historic poets and writers as beloved heroes who were able to preserve their culture in the face of foreign Arab domination. And Iranians are as familiar with these, with their classical writers as we would be the names of presidents or rock stars. They often sprinkle conversation with quotes from their Persian literature. Indeed, there are shrines and museums dedicated to classical Persian poets, which are major tourist attractions. Um, I've never encountered such adulation for poets in other countries, could not imagine such veneration in American, of American authors, for example. Well, closely associated with the Iranian love of literature is their educational level. Adult literacy is 95%, and Iranians were especially proud to tell me that women comprise over 60% of university students. Now, Persian is the official language of Iran. It's known as Farsi by its native speakers. The language has an Indo-Aryan origin, which is why there are similarities in certain words and grammar with European languages. It is the descendant of old Persian from the days of the empire. An example of its very artistic script is shown on this wall sign behind a traditional water pipe. Now, like Arabic, Farsi is written from right to left. It uses much of the same alphabet and pronunciation, but the vocabulary is entirely different because Arabic in contrast to Farsi, is a Semitic language of the Afro-Asian family. So most Farsi-speaking Iranians do not speak Arabic. In fact, they frequently told me they refuse to speak or learn it as a point of cultural pride. Now, due to the influx of minorities from adjacent and nearby countries, there are also some segments of Iran with dominant Turkish or Armenian or Kurdish-speaking populations, such as this Kurdish man, who can be identified by his clothing, his pleated baggy trousers belted by a wide waistband. But virtually everyone can understand and can read the national language of Farsi. And so Iran's volatile history continued after its golden age. There were successive invasions and dynasties and hereditary monarch rulers known as Khans or Shahs. And until the uh, 1920s, a new dynasty arose 
ruled by the Pahlavi family, and they took power in a coup d'etat. And the new Shah was known for wanting to modernize the old Persian empire. He wanted to bring it into the 20th century, and he focused on literacy, roadway and infrastructure building, health, industry, and agriculture. For millennia, Iran had been called Persia. The Shah decided to change the name in 1934 to Iran, which is derived directly from the word Aryan, meaning of noble origin. And the United States supported the Shah because of his programs of social and economic modernization, like these wind turbine installations. Unlike many of the Shah's predecessors who concentrated only on religious buildings, Shah Pahlavi commissioned secular buildings in strikingly modern styles, like Tehran's Carpet Museum, its Museum of Contemporary Art, and the very beautiful monolithic Azadi, meaning freedom, tower, being among the best. And when I spoke with older Iranians about this period of their history, many told me they were quite fond of the reforms, including expanded women's rights and the improvement in literacy. But unfortunately, the Shah's rule became increasingly autocratic, marked by arbitrary arrests and torture used to crush all forms of political opposition. For a conservative, mainly rural Muslim population, the Shah's reforms were too fast. Opposition to the Shah coalesced around their leader, a man named Ayatollah Khomeini, depicted here, uh, who was eventually banished from the country. And by the way, an Ayatollah is an honorific designating a high-ranking cleric of the Shia or Shiite branch of Islam, which dominates in Iran. And then things got even worse. There was a worldwide spike in oil prices in the 1970s. Iran's economy was flooded with foreign currency and inflation reached double digits. Nationwide strikes and demonstrations finally forced the Shah to flee the country and Ayatollah Khomeini returned from exile in 1979 to form a new government. Now, during the time that the Shah was in power, Khomeini made frequent broadcasts on the BBC's Persian service from London as the leader of the opposition. And what he told the people in those broadcasts was that he wanted to return to lead the country afresh, but he would continue all of the social and economic reforms that the Shah had achieved. He simply would not be a ruler that would dominate, that would have a strong police presence in their lives. And that's what he promised, that he would take a hands-off, statesmanlike role and let the government be democratic. Well, they welcomed him back. And of course, the people were wrong, for on his return, Khomeini quickly established a clergy-dominated Islamic republic and he rejected all of the social reforms that the Shah had instituted. In order to enforce the laws of his new Islamic system, he formed the Revolutionary Guards to protect the system and prevent foreign interference. An allied group called the Basij were a responsible for morals policing and the suppression of dissident gatherings. Well, through the force of his character and the Revolutionary Guards, Khomeini remained leader until his death in 1989. Today, he is officially known as Imam Khomeini, raising him essentially to the level of saint. Almost every town in the country has a street or square that's been named by the government after him, or a prominent memorial monument. His portrait is everywhere, often beside and thus legitimizing that of his successor, shown here in the lower center, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Well, the Islamic Revolution and the opposition demonstrations, which have occurred periodically since 1979, highlight the vast chasm that I found exists today among segments of the Iranian population. And my purpose in traveling was in large part to gauge the depth and extent of these attitudes and conversations with casual acquaintances on the street, as well as deeper discussions when I was invited, invited into Iranian homes.
And what I found is this. Perhaps one half of the population is extremely frustrated with and opposed to the restrictions, both religious and freedom of expression, that were instituted uh, by, the, uh, by the revolution. For those old enough to remember, most people were certainly glad to see the departure of the Shah, but they never imagined that the new regime would be so oppressive. Iran is a young country. Half its population is under 35. They're not accustomed to such repression. And the uh, population got younger after the 1980s war with Iraq, as Iranian women were encouraged to have more children to replace young men killed during that fighting. At first, the young population was encouraged by the availability of information they could obtain on the internet. Now, with the new regime, internet sites are blocked and there is an arrest and jailing of online bloggers and activists. And as a result, for many Iranians, especially the young, the pursuit of fun has been outlawed. There are today government rules against the spread of Western culture and such formally prevalent enjoyments as street cafe life and group socializing are outlawed. Mixed gender parties are outlawed. Dancing is against the law. Smoking is against the law. Of course, human nature being what it is, these activities still occur, but in inconspicuous or private locations and with great caution. As evidence of that, in our travels around the countryside, at one point we crossed over a hill and our attention was diverted by a family group who had stopped their car in a somewhat inconspicuous location. They rolled down the windows, turned the radio on, on full volume for songs and then got out and danced in this strange location. Why? Because they felt they wouldn't be seen here dancing. This is the only place that they might get away with expressing themselves. Perhaps the most conspicuous evidence of Islamic control of daily life are the regulations concerning female dress. Women, including foreign visitors, are by law are required to wear a headscarf, known as a hijab. Some women choose to wear the tent-like black chadors as an even stricter religious obligation. And here you see they are displayed in a shop for sale. And as you see, they're available in every color as long as it's black. Well, in practice, though, nowadays, especially in the cities and some of the more liberal larger towns, I often observe more casual adherence to the dress code, scarves fashionably placed at the back of the head, and skin-tight leggings, as well as women taking on distinctive and attractive scarves. Well, I didn't see any of the bands of the roving morality police to punish the violators, although admittedly we did not visit the Iranian cities most known for their conservative Islamic practices. During one of our walks, an Iranian woman came up to my wife and admonished her because her headscarf left a tiny area of her shoulder skin exposed. Well, she didn't respond well to this unsolicited criticism. Yet, Perhaps ironically, and not well known outside of the country, women are allowed to drive personal vehicles. Some drive taxis. They also hold public office and have high-level professional careers. Many, but not all, Iranian women would hurriedly apply their headscarf when our international flight landed in Tehran, but just as quickly uncover on our departure from Iranian airspace at the end of our visit. And while Iranian women must cover their hair by law, they do not have to cover their faces. And since that's the only part of their bodies they can legally show off, they want them to be as perfect as possible. And so amazingly, we were surprised to see that plastic surgeons who do nose jobs, among other facial rearrangements, do a roaring business, women and also men whose noses are still bandaged after their surgery are a common sight on Tehran streets. Well, for the other half of the Iranian population, Khomeini is revered as an earnest, intensely committed leader, a family man who lived a modest life, a religious head who they believe set the country on a more wholesome moral course. Well, the revolution's loyalists and their families are rewarded with the republic's best jobs and positions of power. 
certainly it's difficult to say how many of these people are truly committed to the conservative religious philosophy of the revolution versus how many simply affirm the dogma as opportunists for economic advancement. Now, before visiting Iran, we had heard that Iranians love Americans, and this seems somewhat difficult to believe given the political and economic sanctions imposed by the United States on Iran. But as we traveled, we were frequently asked our home country, which always prompted a slight surprise given how few Americans visit Iran today, but then a broad smile and wishes for a wonderful visit. When even one person spoke limited English, we were engaged in conversation and often found ourselves with invitations to be their guests at restaurants and home dinners. Out of courtesy, we didn't pursue issues of Middle East politics. Some did divulge their dislike for what they interpret as Israeli aggression, but at the same time, their esteem for the Jewish religion. You may know that Islam embraces Judaic prophets and a popular pilgrimage site in the country are the tombs believed to be the burial place of Esther and her cousin Mordecai in the Jewish religion. There are indeed some 12 to 15,000 Jews in Iran, which is the largest community outside of Israel. In contrast, in most Arab countries, Jewish communities have dwindled to 2,000 or fewer. So despite the anti-Israel propaganda, the Jewish communities in Iran, some of whom I met, as shown here, told me that they are able to live, work, and worship in relative tranquility. But aside from viewing the magnificent countryside and interacting with the people, visitors come to Iran for the architecture, for the arts and crafts, and of course, for the unique food. Architecture is often regarded as the field in which Persia made its greatest contribution to world culture. Persian architecture and decoration has strongly influenced buildings throughout Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, even India in the design of the Taj Mahal. Virtually every town and village in Iran has some historic structure. Most of the greatest buildings were originally made for religious purposes, for Zoroastrianism and then Islam. The defining characteristics of Persian architecture are, above all, its monumentalism, the lavish use of surface ornamentation, color, and precise geometry. Typical mosque design may incorporate bulbous dome above an entrance, uh, which is shown here. Uh, here is a stunning interior view of that dome. And the mosque entrance then draws vis worshippers into an enormous courtyard surrounded by arched cloisters. This is that courtyard. In this image, prayer rugs are being laid out for the main Friday service. One of the distinctive features of this architectural decoration on the sanctuary ceiling is a stone carving re resembling a honeycomb known as a mukana. The portal walls and interior are exquisitely ornamented on every square inch with colored tiles and Quranic calligraphy. The tall cylind cylindrical towers on the outside, called minarets, are also architectural masterpieces. They were called, of course, to call faithful Muslims to daily prayer, but as the largest structure in a town, they also served as a landmark for traders trying to find their way to accommodations as they cross the desert. Iran's most beautiful city is Esfahan. It was once the capital of Persia. It is the, today the number one tourist destination. It has one of the most famous covered shopping bazaars in the country and a series as well of picturesque bridges. This is an elaborate bridge over a now dry riverbed. The city's centerpiece, though, is the enormous Nakshi Jahan Central Square. This is the second largest public space in the world after Beijing's Tiananmen Square. It is flanked by 500-year-old architectural masterpieces of mosques, palaces, and historic Islamic universities. Well, Persian architecture encompasses structures spanning some three 
thousand years, uses as diverse as caravan lodgings for the Silk Road traders, known as caravanserai, pyramidal mud brick houses that were used to store ice during the hot summer, glittery Islamic mausoleum shrines for the dead, beautifully frescoed hammam bathhouses with their vaulted ceilings, some of which today have been converted and used as restaurants. There are thick, there are brick vaulted shopping bazaars, some as in the city of Shiraz, containing hundreds of stores selling everything from sweets to spices and guaranteed to disorient you in a maze of twisting and turning lanes off the main thoroughfares. There are also traditional courtyard houses of 18th century merchants and Atop these buildings are these louvered, four-sided structures called badgers, or wind towers. They were used to capture the light breezes from the higher elevations and funnel them down to a basement where they would travel over ice and then rise up to the living spaces, a kind of pre-electricity air conditioning. Riding through the countryside, one encounters atmospheric ruins of mud castles and forts, and scattered throughout the mountains are ancient isolated villages, a serene contrast to the tumult of the urban areas. They have steep twisting lanes filled with crumbling mud brick houses, the homes taking on the color of the background hillside, and containing wooden lattice windows, which were used to preserve privacy, and fragile wooden balconies. In another part of the country, the village of Kandovan has mountainside homes and shops carved right out of the eroded rock. And people are living in these spaces today. As you continue to travel through the countryside, you're likely to encounter Iran's nomads. There are about a million people of Iran, mostly of Turkish or Kurdish descent, who travel from place to place in families numbering as many as 75, moving their herds and sheep between summer and winter pastures. Nomadic women are not as conservative as the uh, urban people. They typically wear long, colorfully layered dresses, but no head coverings. I found them generally agreeable to be uh, to my visit. Iranians are justifiably proud of their arts and crafts. They span so many different talents, miniature Persian painting, calligraphy, basketry. There is stamped metalwork and intricate tile work. There is glassware and ceramics. Two of the most famous arts in Iran are the art of uh, stained glass making featured in historic public buildings and private residences. And the stained glass, which uh, has uh, been developed to a very high art, was used to bring in natural light, but also to preserve modesty and privacy. Their best known craft, though, as you can perhaps imagine, is producing carpets. Carpets for mosques or for personal use with skills that have been honed by millennia of practice. A Persian carpet is, for Iranians, a display of wealth, an investment, and an integral aspect of their religious and cultural festivals. It is also a part of everyday life at home. Carpets are the country's highest value export after oil. And carpet patterns, usually symmetrical, there are geometric and floral motifs to evoke the beauty of the classical Persian garden. Urban carpets tend to use more silk. Rural ones are woven from less expensive sheep, goat, or camel hair. Iranians have had more than 2,500 years to perfect the art of carpet making, and I must say, just as long to perfect the art of carpet selling. And so as we negotiated for a carpet purchase, bargaining hard over a glass of tea is the rule. And again, our guide was indispensable in assisting us to pay a fair price. The food of Iran is unique. The Persian philosophy of food indicates that to maintain a balanced diet, you should eat together hot and cold foods. Hot, cold foods are things like yogurt, cheese, radishes, and fresh herbs, and they act to balance the hot foods like meats and sweet dishes. 
Even when the menu is dominated by the ubiquitous lamb kebab shown here, its accompaniment by sumptuous rice dishes with their delicate flavors combined with herbs, saffron, fruits, and nuts made these dishes memorable. And of course, no meal is complete without the crisp and golden flatbreads breads that are prepared fresh and carried to these uh, to restaurants every day. Tea houses, which have been uh, restricted un under the Islamic system, but which still are able to exist in certain places uh, that are more liberal, have traditionally played an important role in Iranian life and places where Iranians go to socialize and eat with tea, water pipes, and food, mixing in cavernous halls and patrons sitting on carpeted platforms. Of course, the best cooking, as we are frequently reminded, is served in Iranian homes. And we were fortunate to have this experience memorable, not only for the quality of the food, but the humbling hospitality of our hosts. Alcohol is banned in the country, but there are freshly blended delicious fruit juices and fruit milkshakes available on nearly every street in towns. Now, we are from the news, of course, familiar with the economic restrictions on American companies from doing business in Iran, the sanctions. And frequently, we read at home about the resulting shortages and necessities and medicines that Iranian people are suffering under. So it was another surprise during our travels that for the most part, Iranians, well, they didn't do not appear to have been crippled economically by US sanctions. And they are still enamored of American culture and values. Stores that we went into seemed well stocked. Markets seemed very full in business and busy. Coca-Cola, an American product, presumably not allowed in Iran, was prominently offered nearly everywhere. The sanctions instead, though, have limited American business, but given opportunities to other countries who do not follow these sanctions, France, Japan, Germany, to provide their products to sell to the Iranians. There are French Peugeot and Japanese vehicles, German Bosch appliances everywhere. And in this world, this flat age of multinational corporations, you can find when you travel through the country, big pens, Snickers candy, and a host of other American products in most places, including even Apple iPhones. We even spotted a sign for Starbucks coffee, all this, although this, I believe, was just an imitation. Of course, I don't want to be glib about the sanctions because they have, on a nationwide scale, hurt the Iranian economy and particularly reduced the value of their currency. Inflation is rampant, and that is why Iranians so much want them to be rescinded. Now, the Iranian generosity of spirit was shown to us on so many occasions. In particular, when I slipped hiking down these steps from a mountain fortress and bloodied my knee and elbow, others on the trail immediately clustered around to offer their assistance. And by the time I reached the bottom with my guide's assistance, the news about Mr. Boston had arrived, and the tea and souvenir sellers were at the ready to apply antibiotic, cotton, and bandages. Well, in conclusion, Iranians know that American politics has isolated their country in many ways, and they are anxious to rejoin the international community. Some people told me that they believe that American and Iranian conflict stems from the fact that our personalities are so similar. We are both proud people who want to control their own destiny. As I've indicated in this program, the society is now very much divided. A new government with a moderate a more moderate president, Rouhani, was elected in 2013, but in recent years, a more hardline president was put in power. Yet, ultimate power continues to reside with the Ayatollah Khamenei and his Mullah cleric supporters. It does remain to be seen whether this conflict between both sides of the population will bring about another revolution or what most people prefer, a continually evolving separation of mosque and state. But what is unquestioned 
despite the political uncertainties, is that the Iranian people have opened their hearts to visitors and feel honored to share their ancient and sophisticated culture firsthand with outsiders, including Americans. And it is these experiences that will live longest in our memory. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Right. That was wonderful. That was really fascinating and interesting talk. Thank you. There are um, there are some questions here. Let me just see if I can get my. Super so unmuted though. Yeah, you can either unmute yourself or you could type something in the chat. Yes, we have a couple of questions in the chat, and no. <laughs> Helen. So I was there. Yeah, I was there um, about uh, six. Now, six or seven years ago. And certainly, I would note that much has changed between the Iran and the United States since then. But during the intervening years, I, I have from time to time consulted with more recent travelers about their experiences. And although our political relationship has suffered some setbacks, and there certainly was heightened animosity during the Trump administration, I was told by returning visitors again and again that. Iranians still have admiration, even love, for American people, and that, that does not diminish. And of course, their history, their architecture, and the culture remain as vibrant as ever. Uh, another comment, I mentioned that I travel without a guide. Uh, no, yeah, so you, uh, there are three nationalities that have to travel with a guide. Uh, they are Canadians, uh, British, and Americans all need to go with a guide, which I had arranged with a, a local company through the internet uh, from the United States. Okay. So any more questions? Let's see here, Barry, we have one more. How useful is an Apple phone? Uh, an Apple phone, we, we did not have an Apple phone when we were there. I don't think, uh, I'm not sure what the current situation is. I have a feeling that service would be restricted uh, in Iran today. Okay, that was really wonderful. I mean, I, I, it's so refreshing to know that they're these that they love us. I mean, they do. Yeah. And you know, if you they like us. What's that? They 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 do love us. Uh, I mean, you know, they're enamored with uh, American culture, with American people. They they can uh, even those who support their government can really see through uh, the uh, political um, direction of the country versus attitudes toward our, our uh, government uh, attitudes toward our people. and um you know part of that is historic because we were uh, great friends uh, 1979 is not all that long ago but uh you know we do have a history of being very close um, and um you know, I think that some of the uh, attitudes about certainly American culture, American music uh, is is very popular when when people can can get it over there, uh, and and young people are enamored with the American way of life in a, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, in terms of photography, I was allowed to take pictures anywhere in the country except for a tiny area of uh, section of road which uh, our guy told us was adjacent to their uh, nuclear facility where they restricted, they did not allow photography. Otherwise, I had no restrictions at all. Obviously, I was in some respect when taking pictures of people. I always asked permission. Uh, and in most cases, people were okay with it. Sometimes uh, I took pictures from behind not to expose faces. Um, but of course, if somebody uh, didn't want to have that picture taken, then uh, clearly I respected that as well. But photography was, as you could see, with the range of pictures I have, photography was uh, was was welcomed. Uh, they were they're very proud of their country and uh, wanted to have some of their culture documented. Beautiful photographs, beautiful, and I love the one of the family dancing out in the yes isolated well, that was so area. Telling. That was so revealing. At first, we had no idea what they were doing until you know we we 
talk to them a bit and and they were nervous and and they were glad and they kept looking over their shoulder and they were so glad that they had an opportunity to express themselves and dance mm. in ways that they could not do at home or mm. could not do mm. out in public that must be so difficult to live with those mm. rules oh, how we take our fr freedoms for granted so does anyone else have any questions you can you're able to unmute yourself and ask them of Barry he's He's a wealth of information about this topic, and I, I'm so glad he's here with us. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you very much, uh, Barry. Uh, my husband was from Iran, uh, from Rasht, Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, did you get to go to the northern up near the Caspian Sea? Did not. I did not get that far. I, I mostly stayed away from the edges, and I wasn't down by the, the coast either because I was there in the summer, and at those lower elevations, it was quite hot. So I really wanted to go to most of the places where the culture was more on display and, and larger population centers to get a chance to speak with people about about their feelings of, uh, of the country. Um, but there, but this, clearly, there are many parts of, of Iran that I did not get to. I had a question about the Lisa. Did you have another question? No, no oh. I was just going to ask about the when you bought purchased the rug. Mm. So yeah. you you negotiated yeah. a price. You kind of bought, yeah. bartered for a price, and then um, they shipped. And then it. we negotiated some more, and then we negotiated some more, and then we had a few cups of tea, and finally we agreed on some back and forth. They they, they consider that to be. Uh, very respectful to negotiate. If you accept the first price, then you're really not right. honoring them. They expect to have a price, a response to have a lower price for things. Especially and, and then they sh you shipped it back home. But we actually, you know, it was we didn't get a large carpet, but we we could have shipped it and it would have been fine. But we ended up taking it with us. We carried it, and that was a time some six years ago or so that uh, airline policies about carrying things on we can hardly remember that time anymore were more lenient when you could uh, actually carry something on on board without running into running afoul of uh, dimensions and things and so on. Right, right. So you're, yeah, that's, so you'd have to declare it, declare, well, they would see it, I guess. It yeah, 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 no, in terms of uh, declaring something, uh, that wasn't a problem either in bringing something back. In terms of U.S. Customs, there was no problem at all uh, mm -hmm. about that. The markets look beautiful. Did they, did they stop pouring tea when the negotiation was over? <laughs> no, not at all. I could have stayed there all afternoon. And uh, uh, we had a schedule, but I could have, no, they, they were lovely. I could have stayed there. In fact, I could have stayed and had tea and not bought anything. And they would have been just as cordial. So uh, it really wasn't about the, the purchase, although clearly they like to make a sale. But uh, it, there were many situations where I went in and was invited into shops and had tea and, and just we then departed mm -hmm. after I spoke with them without purchasing anything. And did the, did the shops have the same of us? The same no, of us? No, no, typically, no, they typically, a couple had something like a samovar, like a Russian samovar, but uh, the, the, typically they just had tea, teapots and, and hot plates. And it's nice that you had some meals in family homes. They invited you to come in. Absolutely. And we were we were very surprised at that because, again, we thought that people would be told by the government to be reticent about connecting with foreigners, especially Americans. And they didn't uh, demonstrate any of that reluctance or any of that fear. Uh, mm -hmm. They would meet in a park and then they would say, uh, how about coming to our house? Uh, we want to you know, have a talk with you. And mm -hmm. we you know, we didn't take advantage of all those invitations, but a number of them we did and found them to be very, very worthwhile, rewarding. Well, that's that's wonderful. Now, uh, Barry, you said there's no smoking, no alcohol. Now, what about the legally. water? What's that? But legally. I mean, people legally. clearly People yeah. can't, you know, I was told you can get hard liquor. You can get anything you want. You just have to. It's just very dangerous to, to do that. Did they throw you in prison for drinking? They could, yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the water pipes? Don't what did they smoke tobacco in the water pipes? Yeah, so uh, so they do, and and in fact, um, so traditionally they had water pipes. When the regime came in, there is a a kind of um, 
a, a kind of uh, laissez-faire attitude. It seems like there are a couple of places, and our guide took us to one of them, there are, a couple, there are a handful of places in the most liberal of cities that the government has a kind of uh, detente with these attitudes, because they know that some of the cafes and the water pipes were previously so popular that they've, they, they, look, they look away from mm. enforcement at just those places, but by and large, they're not anywhere near as prevalent as they had been before. So there are a couple of cafes you can go, or and I wouldn't have known where they were except that the guy knew and and took us there. Okay. And not a whole lot of people go there. They're they're just they're not uh, as popular as they had been. So and so maybe afraid. they view them more as art objects. You know, yes, I think so. A kind of a remnant of the old Iran. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so I had a question about the uh, the COVID pandemic. I was there before COVID, of course. So uh, I think they did suffer from what I read. They did suffer uh, from COVID because of the American sanctions. So a lot of the medications and the uh, vaccines were, uh, if not prevented, at least uh, slowed down. And they had to go through a, a lot of back back room uh, sort of uh, smuggling to get some of those vaccinations into the country. So I think they did suffer more greatly uh, with COVID and fatalities than the rest of the world. Uh, the schools, again, I, they, I I didn't go into any schools per se, but what I did learn and talk with people is that the school system is very sophisticated. And as I say, universities are thriving. The literacy rate is 95% or more now. And uh, women are a, a large part, of, a majority part of university graduates. And they are segregated, the schools? So the uh, women's? They and... are. They, the classes are. The schools are. The classes are. The schools are not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And are there any more questions from our audience? No? This was wonderful, Barry. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for thank, sharing all those. Thank you very much. I hope this photos. was a, a bit of an entree into what life is like in the country today. And uh, of course, it's it's a work in progress. So uh, okay. hope to see things uh, okay, bye. evolving. Okay, so thank you very much. All thank right. You. Yeah, thank you. We really thank you appreciate all. it. And thank yeah. you all for being here. Thank you. Um, thank and, you uh, very, very much. We look much. forward to seeing you in person in a month or so, hopefully. Yes. And I actually just want to tell people that Barry is coming back to us in person on um, March 26th. And it will be an in-person travel talk called Travels to Argentina and Ecuador, Colonial Towns, Colorful Markets, and Indigenous People. And that's in the Keys community room. And I hope some of you might join us for that. Yeah. Good. Sounds terrific. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Thank thanks thank you. again. Thank thank you. You. And um, yeah. to everyone, uh, thank, thank you, Barry. And I'll I'll see you next time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Barry. Good thank night. Good night, everyone. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.